Chapter 8, 20 Days Two weeks after I buried my dog, cholera swept our district. Doctors said the sickness started in southern Malawi back in November. A farmer visiting a funeral brought it north, where it spread like grass fire. Within days, hundreds of people were sick and 12 had died. Cholera is a highly contagious infection that causes severe diarrhea. People mostly get it by eating food or drinking water that's been contaminated with feces. Across Africa, it's an unfortunate companion of every rainy season. Many villages have poorly built latrines that flood with the rains and pollute the wells and streams where people drink. Blowflies also spread the bacteria after crawling out of toilets and landing on food. The diarrhea that results is clear and milky and quickly leads to dehydration. If people aren't treated immediately, they could die. During the famine, people out looking for food became the unwitting carriers. The cholera struck them on the roads and forced them to become sick in the bush. Rainflies and cockroaches then spread the infection onto the banana peels, roots, and corn husks that others picked up to eat. To combat the cholera, the clinic at the trading center started giving away chlorine to clean our drinking water. For months, it tasted like metal. They also advised families to cover the holes of their latrines to keep out the flies. My father made a lid from a piece of iron sheeting, but as soon as it was removed, the fat green blowflies swarmed out like a biblical plague and smashed into your head and face. It was a lot of work trying to swat them and finish your business at the same time. In those days, any signs of diarrhea near the latrine hole caused alarm. Each morning, the cholera, cholera people walked past our house on their way to the clinic, their eyes cloudy and skin wrinkled from dehydration. I'd watch them until they got close, then run down the trail toward home. But as soon as they passed, the starving people would follow. Between hunger and cholera, we had many funerals in Wimby. At home, Jeffrey's Anemia grew worse. Anemia grew worse. His legs became grotesquely swollen with kashoric core. If you touched his foot, your finger left a mark in his bubbled skin, as if the foot were made of clay. Can you feel it? I asked one day, touching the blisters. Does it hurt? I can't feel anything, he said. He also became dizzy and had trouble walking a straight line. One afternoon, I was taking him outside into the sunshine, but he stopped and said, Wait, come back. I can't see. We stood there until his eyes adjusted to the light before we continued. For months, his mother had only served him pumpkin leaves, and now, like Kamba, my cousin was starving to death. With little else to do, my mother took half of our flour for the day and gave it to Jeffrey's mother. There's enough here for porridge, she told her. It isn't much, but I can't watch my own family suffer. We were all losing weight, especially me. The bones were now showing in my chest and shoulders, and the rope belt that I'd made for my pants no longer worked. Now... I just pinched two belt loops together and tied them off the stick, twisting more as I got thinner. My arms and legs looked like blue gum poles and ached all the time. I had trouble squeezing my hand into a fist. One afternoon, I was pulling weeds in the field and my heart started racing so fast. I lost my breath and nearly fainted. What's happening with me, I thought, terrified. I bent down slowly until my knees touched the dirt, then stayed there until my pulse returned to normal and I could breathe again. That same night, I sat in my room with with the lantern while the hunger played games with my mind. If I sat still enough, the walls began to spin in slow circles, like a merry-go-round. I followed a centipede up the wall for what seemed like hours. When a mayfly flew close to the lantern, I grabbed it by the wings and asked, How are you still alive? What are you eating? One thing was certain, no magic could save us now. Starving was a cruel kind of science. Even my father, once a giant man, shriveled like a raisin. Sharp bones now replaced brawny muscle. His teeth seemed bigger, his hair thinner, and for once, I noticed the scars on his skin. One afternoon, he reported having trouble seeing across the courtyard. The hunger was robbing his vision, just as it had Jeffrey's. It seemed the thinner my father became, the more he wanted to weigh himself. He kept a my scale, hanging by a rope near the tool shed, and one morning I watched his routine. He walked out and gripped the hook, then hung there like a sack of grain, staring up at the needle. He made a grunting sound and said, hmm, five kilos, mama. As always, my mother came and looked, but refused to weigh herself. The children were also forbidden. Like many women during the hunger, she started tying her, her pongo tight around her waist like a belt. She said it confused her stomach and tricked her heart from beating so fast, helping her to breathe. At night, she resorted to mind games to help us children. You're losing weight because you're thinking about food, she told us. Don't you know that causes your body to stress and burn more energy? My sisters cried. Asha said, but Mama, I don't want to become swollen. Then think about positive things, my mother told her. Do that for me. The one positive thing we could dwell upon was our mice crop. Out in our field, the stalks had grown as high as my father's chest. 
The first ears had begun to form, revealing traces of red silk on their heads, and the leaves and stalks were fading from deep green to yellow. While men withered and died all around us, our plants were coming up fat and strong. Twenty days, I predicted to my father. I'd say you're right. If I was indeed correct, then we had twenty days until the green mice was ripe enough to eat, what we lovingly call dowing. It's equivalent to the American corn on the cob, when the kernels are soft and sweet and pot between your teeth. All day and night I dreamed of dowie. In the middle of the march, the mize stalks had reached my father's head. At this stage, the flowers told you everything. Once the red and yellow silk began to, began to dry and turn brown, you could start checking for dowie. I, got, I go from stock to stock, pinching the cob to feel the green. If the kernels crushed easily under my fingers, it was too early. But if they felt firm, then it was time. Every morning for a week, Jeffrey and I walked up and down the rows, pointing out ones that were nearly done. Then finally I spotted a cob that appeared ripe and gave it a squeeze. It was firm. This one's ready, I said. Yeah, said Jeffrey, pointing to another. And so is this one, and this one, and this one. Our long-awaited day has finally arrived. Let's eat. Using the last of our energy, we ran through the rows, pulling the ripe dowie and cradling them in our arms. Soon I had 15 ears, and Jeffrey had the same. We peeled back the first layer of husks and tied them all together, then draped the chain across our shoulders. The sight of Jeffrey and me running through the courtyard with necklaces of dowie nearly caused a riot. Is it ready? Asha asked, her eyes wide and excited. Ready. A dowie is ready. In the kitchen, I stoked the coals of my mother's fire until they burned red. Soon my sisters were crowded inside the door, fighting for space. Relax, I shouted. There's plenty of dowie for everyone. I placed several cobs directly on the coals and flipped them until the peels were crisp and blackened. I burned my fingers pulling one off, then stripped the steaming husks and began to eat. The kernels were meaty and warm and filled with the essence of God. I chewed long and slow. Each time I swallowed, I was returning something that had gone missing long ago. Looking up, I saw my parents in the doorway. I don't think this dowie is ready, my father said, snatching one off the fire. He pulled off the silk and took his first bite. Within seconds, the blood of life seemed to rush back into his face. He knew he would live. It's ready, he said, and smiled. That afternoon, we must have eaten 30 ears of mice. As if heaven opened up, the first pumpkins in our field were also ready. My mother boiled them, seeds and all, then served up baskets of the steaming meat. My God, to have a stomach filled with warm food was one of the greatest pleasures in life. Jeffrey and his mother started coming over and enjoying meals of pumpkin and dowie with us. Soon the swelling in Jeffrey's legs went away and he was smiling like his old self. For Jeffrey and me, March was like one big celebration. Each morning before work, we made a fire in the fields and ate a big breakfast of roasted mice and pumpkins. I remembered a parable that Jesus told the disciples, the one about the sower of seeds, the seeds planted along the road get stepped on and damaged. Those planted in rocky soil can't take root, and the ones planted in the thorns get tangled in the barbs. But the seeds planted on fertile soil live and prosper. Mr. Jeffrey, we're like those seeds planted on fertile soil, not on the roadside stepped on by everyone walking past. No, no, not us. That's right. We lived. We survived.